Mark Andreessen has helped a lot of people get rich, including Mark Andreessen. And he's made millions of people's lives more fun, more efficient, or just a little weirder. He's the co-creator of the first widely used web browser. He's the co-founder of the venture capital powerhouse Andreessen Horowitz. And though he hates the industry term unicorn for a private tech firm valued at more than a billion dollars, he's a famously successful unicorn wrangler. He was an early investor in Facebook, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Twitter, Lyft, and more. Andreessen is also aggressively quotable, whether it's his classic 2011 pronouncement that software is eating the world, or his more recent, there are no bad ideas, only early ones. And in 2014, he said, in 20 years, we'll be talking about Bitcoin the way we talk about the internet today. A born bull, Andreessen is an optimist who places his hope for the future squarely in the hands of the 19-year-olds and the startups no one has heard of. As splashy AI such as ChatGPT and Dali begin to permeate our daily lives and the predictable panic revs up, Reason sat down with Andreessen to talk about what the future will look like, whether it's still going to emerge from Silicon Valley, about the role of government in fostering or destroying innovation, and what you should read on your next beach vacation. So let's start with AI. Um, I tend to be skeptical on a pretty basic level of people who want to claim that this time it's different with any given tech or cultural trend. But I guess what I want to start with is, is this time it's different? Yeah, can I do, can I do, the, long, can I do the long answer? Absolutely. It's, okay, good. So, so look, the long answer is like, you know, AI has been kind of the fundamental dream of computer science going all the way back to the 1940s, right? So uh, Alan Turing, Alan Turing used to be this, this obscure historical figure, and then they made the movie The Imitation Game, uh, which I, I, I hear is a great movie, um, which has made him more famous. And, uh, you know, he was sort of one of the, you know, there were a bunch of these guys, but there were a bunch of guys back then who sort of in, invented the computer as, as, as we know it today. You know, and it was during the heat, the heat of World War II. But, but even in the very beginning, you know, they just had this, you know, in this, the, you know, they, human beings, I think, can't resist anthropomorphizing everything. And so he had this kind of, you know, feeling right, his sort of drive right up front saying, like, let's, let's build an electronic brain, right? Let's, let's, let's build artificial intelligence. And so he and John von Neumann and Claude Shannon and a lot of those guys in that era, you know, kind of were, were thinking about this. You know, and, and this is literally when they're like wiring, wiring the first computers together, right? And the, and the computers that they were working with in those days, they were running on vacuum tubes, right? And, and they, they literally would hand wire the computers together, like they were hand soldering the connections. Um, you know, the term computer bug actually comes from the fact that the problem that they had in those days was not a software bug as we understand it today. The problem they would have is that an actual insect would fly into the wiring uh, and would fry. Um, and then that would actually short out the computer. Um, and so that's why, uh, that's why computer problems are called bugs. So anyway, th th this has been a dream, you know, going all, all the way back to that era. And then basically the field of computer science has always had this AI, you know, kind of specialty in it basically for it's like 78 years now. Right. Um, and, you know, to your point, like repeatedly, there was like this dream that, you know, it was finally about to happen. Um, there were, it depends how you count like five or six, like AI booms where people were really convinced that like this time is the time it's going to happen. Um, and then there were what in the field are referred to as the AI winters, right? In which it turns out like, oops, you know, not yet. Um, but I mean, if you think about it, 78 years, like there were AI researchers who literally were born, went to college, got their PhDs, worked in the field their entire career and died <laughs> kind of in, the, in that period without ever actually seeing the results of all of their work. Um, and so it's, it's one of these things where like, you know, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's like one of these things. It's like, it's like, you know, I, you know, Isaac Newton spent a lot of his time pursuing alchemy. Right. Um, and it's like, you know, maybe, may, you know, there are some things that these people kind of spend, you know, decades on or, or even longer and they never work. And then there are some things that are, you know, 78 year, you know, overnight successes. Like some, sometimes these things actually do work. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, so, you know, this feel, I was gonna say, for, for, for sure, we're in another one of those AI booms. It's like AI boom number five or six or seven. Um, for sure, there's this rush of enthusiasm. Um, but there's a couple things that are different about what's happening right now. Um, and the, the, the big thing that's different um, is that there, there are these like very well-defined tests, ways of sort of measuring sort of intelligence-like capabilities, let's say. Um, and uh, computers have started to do actually better than people um, on these tests. And, and these are tests that involve kind of interactions with fuzzy reality. Right? So these aren't just tests of like, can you do math faster? These are tests of like, can you process reality in a superior way? Um, and so the first of those test breakthroughs was in 2012 when computers became better than human beings at recognizing images in uh, recognizing objects in images. 
right? So you like throw up a whole bunch of images, a whole bunch of photographs, right? And it's like, is this, you know, the use the internet meme, is this a cat, right? Or is this like a, you know, cinnamon bun, <laughs> right? Or is this, you know, something else? Um, and computers are now actually better at doing that kind of object recognition and images at scale than people are. That, that's the breakthrough that has made the self-driving car a real possibility, right? Because the because what, what the self-driving car is is basically just processing large amounts of images and trying to understand, you know, is that a kid running across the street or is that a, a plastic bag, right? And should I hit the brakes or should I just keep going? Um, and and self-driving cars are starting to work. Like Tesla's, you know, full self-driving isn't perfect yet, but it's starting to work quite well. And then, um, you know, Waymo, um, uh, one of our companies, you know, I, they, you know, they're up and running now um, in something that people can uh, people can experience. And so, so that's starting to happen. And then. We started to see kind of these breakthroughs in natural, what's called natural language processing about five years ago, where computers started getting really good at understanding um, written English. They started actually getting very good at speech synthesis, which is actually quite an, uh, a, a challenging problem itself. Um, and then most recently, there's this huge breakthrough, you know, in uh, you know, in the the product that sort of uh, come to market called ChatGPT, or you know, more generally, this phenomenon. It's ChatGPT is a is an instance of a broader phenomenon in the field called large language models or LLMs. Um, and, you know, people presumably like, I don't know, a lot, a lot of people have now tried this. And so they've, they've had hands on experience with this. And I'll just tell you, like a lot of people outside the tech industry are shocked by what that thing can do. And I'll just tell you, a lot of people inside the tech industry are shocked by what that thing can do. Um, and so, you know, it, it feels like. One of those gonna, moments. Yeah. yeah, I was actually going to ask that because chat GPT does feel to those of us who don't fundamentally understand what's going on, like a little bit of a, a party trick or a magic trick. Right. And sometimes it's the sort of classic technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And sometimes it, it really is a trick. Um, but, um, you know, you're saying, no, no, this is, this is something real. We can see something real underneath. Well, so it's also a trick. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so it's both, right? So this is why it's such, this is why your question is such an interesting question, right? This is, this is actually a very kind of big, profound, there's a big profound under, underlying question we're going to get to, which is what does it mean to be smart? Like what, and what does it mean to be conscious? What does it mean to be human? Like, like, Ultimately, all the big questions are not what does the machine do. Ultimately, all the big questions are what do we do, right? Um, and, and and so the, the the big underlying question under all this is like what do we do? Like how, how do we, how do we actually like form sentences? How do we actually make arguments? How do we actually like write screenplays and like write poetry and like do all the things we do? And like how much of what we do is a trick? And so that, we'll, we'll we'll come back to that in a second. But but look, so let me let me describe what what LLMs you know what what these things actually are like like ChatGPT. So so what. So what they actually are is they're basically very fancy autocompletes, um, right? And so autocomplete is like a standard computer function. If you have an iPhone, right, whatever, it happens. You know, you start typing a word, and it will offer you an autocompletion, right, of the rest of that word, so you don't have to type the whole word. Um, and then, you know, Google Gmail has autocomplete now for sentences, um, where you start typing a sentence. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't make it to your event. And it will kind of, it'll suggest the, re the rest of the sentence. Um, and, and so basically what, what, what LLMs are is basically autocomplete across a paragraph or across five paragraphs. Right. Or, or by the way, maybe an autocomplete across 20 pages or in the future, by the way, maybe an autocomplete across an entire book. Right. Like, in other words, like you should close your eyes and imagine a future version of this thing. Right. You sit down to write your next book. This literally something is going to happen. You're, you'll sit down to write your next book. Uh, you'll type the first sentence and it will suggest the rest of the book. Right. Now, are you going to want what it suggested? Maybe. <laughs> right. And we'll, we'll come back to scenarios where that might be the case. Uh, probably not. But it's going to give you a suggestion. Right. And it's going to give you a suggestion. It's going to give you suggested chapters. It's going to give you suggested topics. It's going to give you suggested examples. It's going to give you, you know, suggested, you know, ways to word things. You know, you're going to you can already do this with chat GPT. You can type in. It's like, look, here, you know, here's my draft. Like, here, you know, here's you know, here's five paragraphs I just wrote. Um, you know, are, how, how, how could this be worded better? Um, how could this be worded more simply? Um, how could this be worded in a way that people who are younger can understand it, right? And so it, it's going to be able to autocomplete kind of in, in, in all of these kind of very interesting ways. And then, it's, it, and then it's up to the human being who's steering it to decide, um, you know, what to do with that. And, and so this is kind of my point, right? Is, is that a trick or is that a breakthrough, right? It, it, the answer is like, yes, to both. Like, yes, it's a trick. Like, in other words, well, here's a critique. Here's a critique of, um, here's a critique of LLMs. And so there's, there's this guy, Jan LeCun, who's a legend in the field. Of AI, who's who's at, uh, at at Meta, and he's been he's been tweeting this publicly. He's, his, his Twitter account's gotten very active lately, um, and uh, he's like, look, he's like, he, he's argue, he argues this is more trick than breakthrough, and he argues basically it's like, look, this thing autocompletes, right? It, it's like a puppy. It like autocompletes the text it thinks you want to see, but it doesn't actually understand any of the things that it's saying. Like it doesn't actually know who people are. It doesn't know how physics works. It doesn't know how math works. 
right? Like it doesn't like it, and, and, and it has this thing that's called hallucination in the field where like, if it doesn't have an autocomplete that's like factually correct, it's like a puppy, it still wants to make you happy. And so it will autocomplete a, a hallucination and it will, it will start making up like names and dates and historical events that never happened. You know, the thing that that always sounds like to me, I know the term is hallucination. The thing that it always connects with to me is imposter syndrome. I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, I, I don't know whether humans have the imposter syndrome or the AIs do, but we're, we're all just saying the thing that we think someone wants to hear. So, so this goes to the underlying question, which is what do people do, right? And, and, th and this is where things get like incredibly uncomfortable, like for, you know, for a lot of people to think about this, which is like, okay, like, like what is human consciousness? Like, how do we form ideas? Like, how do we decide? I, I mean, I, 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 I don't know about you. <laughs> what, what I've found in my life is that mo number one, a lot of people in a day-to-day -day basis are just telling you what they think you want to hear. Right. And, and it's just, and for a lot of people, it's just much more Maybe comfortable. Maybe more for you than for me. But maybe, maybe, although, you know, look, a lot of this just, you know, walking down the street or working with, some, you know, working with anybody in a professional context or, you know, working, you know, work with the customers, you know, take, you know, buy, buy, a, buy a coat and then take it back next week and complain to the customer service rep, right? The customer service rep, you know, they're thinking, wow, you know, this person is a real, you know, whatever, like, but they're not saying that, like they're saying, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, miss customer, you know, how can I help you? Right. So, so life is full of these, like, <laughs> life is full of these autocompletes <laughs> kind of as, as is. And then look, like, you know, you see this in intellectual debate, like an in intellectual debate. I mean, you, you guys, you know, live, live, live this life. Like how many people are making arguments that they actually have conceived of, right. Um, and that they actually believe versus how many people are making arguments in any intellectual debate that are basically the arguments that they think people are expecting them to make. Right. And, 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 you know, this is where you see this thing in politics where basically it's this weird thing in politics that you, you guys are kind of an exception to. It's a weird thing in politics where most people have the exact same sets of views as everybody else on their side on every conceivable issue. Right. Um, right. And isn't that a coincidence every time how that happens? Every single time. Right. And it's like, well, it is, and, and, you know, what do we know? We know that the, those people have not sat down and thought through all of those issues from first principle. And they, we, we know that they haven't automatically arrived at all the same views. We know that's what's, ha what's happened, of course, is a social reinforcement mechanism. Right. So pe people are saying what they what they what they think is necessary to fit into society. So is that actually any better than the machine essentially trying to do the same thing? Like, I, I think it's kind of the same. Like, so I think what we're going to learn is that we're a lot more like Jet GPT <laughs> than, than we thought. Right. Well, so there's another um, another way to come at this, which is uh, the, the, there's this thing called the Turing test. Right. So Alan, Alan Turing, I mentioned, he, he, he's sort of early on. He created this this thing called the Turing test. Um, and the Turing test was basically his, his attempt to basically he said, look, if let's suppose we develop what we think is an AI. Let's suppose we, we develop a program and we think it's, it's smart in the same way that a person is smart. Um, and, you know, how will we know that it's actually smart? And so he proposed this thing called the Turing test. And in the Turing test, basically, you have a human subject and then they're in a chat room and they're in a chat room with a human being and with a computer. Um, and both the human being and the computer they're in the chat room with are trying to convince them that they're actually the real person and that the other one is the computer. Right. Um, and then basically, and then the question is basically, is the computer as good as or better than the person, right? The other person at convincing the subject that they're actually a human being. Right. And, and so the theory there basically is the test is if a computer can convince you that it's a human being, then it, then it effectively is AI. Like it's, 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 it's every bit as intelligence, intelligent and sentient and conscious as a, as a, as a human. The obvious problem with the Turing test, right, is that we're really, people are really easy to trick, right? We're like super easy to con, right? And like life is filled with like, you know, everybody's life is filled with people trying to con them. Every time you watch a TV commercial, they're trying to, you know, con you. Every time you talk to a salesperson, you know, there's just this constant, not, you know, every time you're, you know, three card Monty, you know, you know, magician doing a card trick, politician on TV, right? They're always trying to con you in some way. And we know, you know, we know that human beings are like relatively susceptible to being conned. And so, a computer that's good at conning you, right? It, is that actually like, is that AI or is that just basically revealing an underlying weakness in actually what we think of as that which is profoundly human, which is like, we're really easy to trick. And if we're that easy to trick, it's like, okay, well, how smart are we? Right. And so I, th so I think th you see what I'm saying? Like it, it, there's no single, there's no single vector of like smart versus non-smart. It's more like, okay, there's certain sets of things that people can do better or worse. Um, there's certain th sets of things computers can do better or for worse, you know, better or worse. Um, the things computers can do that are better are getting really good. Um, I mean, art, another way to think about this, if you try like mid journey or Dolly or these new, uh, AI art generating things, but like, you know, these things now, like at their best, they're generating art that is, I think pretty clearly, let's say, um, you know, aesthetically superior is like a very deep, uh, a thing, but let's just say more beautiful. Like they're able to produce art that is more beautiful than all, but maybe a handful of human artists, like just objectively you look at it and you're like, wow, that's beautiful. Um, right. and so, you know, two years ago, it's did also, we expect, 
did we expect a computer to making to be making beautiful art? No, we didn't. Can it do it now routinely? Yes. What does that mean in terms of what human artists do? Like if there's only a few human artists that can produce art that beautiful, maybe we're not that good at making art. Maybe, the, you know, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think a lot of, you know, you've been sort of using the language of humanity, like humans are like this. Humans have these attributes. Um, but some of this at least is cultural. And the question it raises for me is one that I think is also kind of a political question. How much does it matter where these AIs emerge? Like, should we care if AIs are um, American or c coming out of Silicon Valley versus coming from another cultural place? So I think we should. <laughs> so among the things that we're talking about here, are the uh, among the things we're talking about are the future of warfare, right? So, you know, what is an, you know, you can see it in the self-driving car. Like if you have a self-driving car, that means you can have a self-flying plane, right? That means you can have a self-guided submarine, right? That means you can have like, you know, smart drone, you can have, you know, you have this concept now we see in Ukraine with the so-called loitering munitions, right? Which is basically a suicide drone. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a drone that's a suicide bomb, basically. Suicide being that it, it kills itself. Um, but it just like stays in the sky until it sees a target and it just like zeroes in and, and you know, drops a grenade or it, it itself is the bomb. Um, and so this whole, like the, the whole era, the whole era, I mean, I just watched the new Top Gun movie. Right. Um, and like, and they kind of, they alluded to this a little bit in the movie, which is, it's like a human being, you know, to train an F-16 or F-18, like fighter pilot, right. Um, is like, you know, I don't know, seven, eight, 10, $15 million plus it's a, it's a, you know, a very valuable human being. Um, and you know, we put these people in these tin cans and then we fly them through the air at, you know, whatever mock, whatever. And then, you know, they actually do a good job in the movie of like the G force issue, right. Which is like, there's, you know, the, the plane is capable of maneuvering in ways that will actually kill the pilot. Um, and so what the plane can do is actually constrained by what the, what the, what the human body can actually uh, put up with. And then by the way, the, the plane that is capable of sustaining human life is like very big and expensive, right. And has all these systems to be able to accommodate the human pilot look, a supersonic AI drone is not going to have any of those restraints, right? So first of all, it's going to cost a fraction of the price, right? Um, second is it can be, you know, much smaller, or by the way, much bigger. Um, it doesn't need to have even the shape that we are associate today with, like it could have any shape that's aerodynamic, right? It doesn't need to like take into account, you know, human pilot. Um, it can fly faster, it can maneuver faster, it can do all kinds of turns, right? And, you know, acceleration, all kinds of things that human, the human uh, pilot's body can't tolerate. Um, it can make decisions much more quickly, you know, it can generate much more information, you know, per, per second than, than any human being can. It can make, you know, decisions very fast. And then by the way, you're not just going to have one of those, like you're going to have, you know, at a time, you're going to have 10 or a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 or a hundred thousand of those things flying at the same time. Right. And so these things are going to come out of the sky in swarms. Um, there's a, uh, there's one movie that has gotten this right. It's a, it's a movie, it's an action movie. Uh, Gerard Butler is called uh, uh, Angel Has Fallen. Um, and uh, in the opening scene, uh, there's a, a terror attack against the, uh, the the U.S. president in the movie, played by, of course, Morgan Freeman, um, is uh, fishing um, on this big, beautiful lake. And he's got all these, you know, Secret Service guys around. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, there's what looked like a flock of birds, you know, big flock of birds coming from the distance. And it turns out they're, you know, suicide drones. Um, and the movie does a really good job of showing, like, what that kind of attack is going to be like. Um, and it's like, this is all ha like, this is all underway. Like, this is this is all happening. This is all going to happen. Like, this is just very, very clear. It's very obvious. Um, it's going to happen very broadly. You know, look, the, 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 the nation states with the best AI capabilities are going to have the best defense capabilities. The, by the way, the DOD is already on this. The DOD, the Department of Defense in the U.S. has already declared that AI is what they call the third offset, which is basically means the future of warfare. Right. So they're, they're going to completely rotate how they spend money. Um, and so, like, this is it. Like, future, you know, if, if there's ever, a, if there's ever, I mean, God forbid, but if there's ever war between the U.S. and China, like, this is the form that it's going to take. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to matter. It's, you know, it's like asking who had the atomic bomb. Like, it's, it's going to matter a great deal. Do you think, uh, like, I think that that's, you know, the kind of national security implications are obviously huge. Um, I also wonder about it kind of from the other direction. Like, will our AIs have American values or American personalities or something like that? I, I'm sort of wondering about, like, not only the effects, but also, you know, is there is there a cultural component to the type of AI we're going to get, or is that a math problem? And it's that you know it's wrong to think about it as having this kind of human overlay. No, so I think it's one hundred percent. I think that's one hundred percent right. And, and furthermore, I guess what I, the way I would think about it is, if you look at the fight that's happened over social media, both in the U.S. and in China, right over the last ten years, right, where both in the U.S. there's been a massive fight over like what values are encoded into social media and like what you know censorship you know controls and what you know ideologies are allowed to you know perpetuate and so forth. 
Um, like there's been a massive fight on that in the U.S. And, and of course, there's a constant running fight on that in China, right, which is, you know, the Great Firewall, and they've got all their restrictions on what they'll allow you to, to show if you're a Chinese citizen. And then there's these cross-cultural questions, right, which is this sort of whole thing where people are wondering, it's like, well, you know, TikTok is a Chinese platform running in the U.S. with, you know, American users, and especially like American children using it. Like, you know, is, you know, a lot of people have theories, at least, that TikTok is, the TikTok algorithm is very deliberately steering U.S. kids towards, you know, destructive behaviors. Um, and is that, you know, some sort of foreign, you know, basically, uh, you know, operation, hostile operation. And, and so any, anyway, like the, to the extent that these are all big issues in this previous era of social media, I think all of these issues magnify out by like a million times uh, in this AI area. Like all of those issues become just like far more dramatic and far more important and far more profound. Um, and the reason is just because user generated content is kind of what we're talking about, like user generated content on social media, people only generate so many kinds of content. They only engage on so many different kinds of issues, whereas AI is going to be universal. Like AI is going to be applied to everything. It's going to be involved in everything. It's going to be integral to the healthcare system. It's going to be integral to the, you know, it's like the financial system to ed education. It's going to permeate education. Um, right. Um, and so it, it's going to be relevant to basically every field of human activity where anybody can have an opinion about anything. Um, and is then- that yeah. Is that uh, what you just described? Is that a case for um, early and cautious regulation? Is that a case for the impossibility of regulation? Where does that take us in terms of what lawmakers could or should be doing? Well, what, what would Reason Magazine say about uh, well intentioned government regulation? I think you know. The Reason Magazine, well, so actually, we're doing um, a debate issue coming up, and we have, um, we have a debate on regulation of AI. And there are people who are, of course, deeply skeptical of governments who still say, well, maybe they're, maybe this is the moment for guardrails. You know, maybe at least we want to say we want to limit how states can use AI, for instance, um, even if we don't want to limit individuals. I mean, I'll, I'll make your own argument back to you, um, which I know you'll enjoy, right? Which is like, you know, the right. road to hell, right? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, you know, the, the, you know, everybody always wants, it's like, boy, wouldn't it be great this time, right? If we could have like very carefully calibrated, well thought through, like rational, reasonable, right? Like effective, like regulation, like, wouldn't that be great? Like, you know, maybe this time we can make rent control work, right? Mm -hmm. If we just, you know, if we just like, if we just, if we're a little bit smarter about it, I mean, I, you know, your own argument, you know, your own argument obviously is like, well, no, that's not actually what, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, that's not actually what happens, right? For all, all the reasons you guys talk about all the time. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, there's an abstract theoretical argument for such a thing. We don't get the abstract theoretical regulation. We get the practical real world regulation, you know, and, and, and what do we get off the other side, right? We get regulatory capture. Um, you know, we get, we get, uh, you know, we get, we get corruption. Um, you know, we get, we get basically incumbent early incumbent lock-in. Um, you know, we get, we get basically political capture. Um, you know, we, I mean, we get, we get, we get all this, you know, we get, we get basically skewed, skewed incentives. Um, and then, you know, years later, we wonder like, how could we've done that to ourselves? And it's because everybody at, in, in that moment said, wow, we really need some sort of well-intentioned regulation that we can't actually get. So, I mean, you know, look, God bless. You know, I don't know. They'll probably try to get, you know, this is, and then this is the other thing is like, you know, is it, is it good or bad that our government is largely dysfunctional? Um, and, you know, generally speaking, can't pass legislation. <laughs> you know, the, the libertarian in me says, you know, this is, this is a case where gridlock is good. Um, you know, look, the straight power politics version of this is like, we can't even ban TikTok, right? Like, you know, American social media companies aren't allowed to operate in China. Uh, the Chinese company is allowed to operate in the U.S. with total impunity. Um, you know, you do look at the content on TikTok that's going at kids in the U.S. and you do wonder, like, what's going on. And there have been repeated attempts, right, to block, you know, TikTok in the U.S. And they've all, you know, it, it, it's still, you know, TikTok is still running in the U.S. just fine. So I don't know. It's like we, we, we can't even ban TikTok. You know, um, we, you know, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't effectively regulate the too big to fail banks. You know, we, you know, I, I <laughs> color me skeptical, but, you know, yeah, I'm sure they'll try. Um, you've talked a lot, you're on record, talking about the quite rapid process through which innovative tech startups become kind of grumpy, enmeshed incumbents, um, both just with the state and more generally in their business practices. Um, that topic has come up a lot recently with the Twitter files and, you know, the sort of revelations of the ways that companies um, collaborated with, uh, willingly, I think, in many cases, but maybe with a looming threat as well, um, with government agencies around misinformation and other questions. Um, it seems to me like we're going to be in for more of that, that this sort of blurring of the lines between public and private is our fate. Um, is that what it looks like to you? And if so, you know, is that ultimately a thing that threatens innovation? Or are there ways in which it could potentially speed things along? 
Yeah, so you know, look, the, the textbook view of the American economy is that it's a, you know, it's a, it's a free, it's free market competition, and like you know, companies are fighting it out, and you know, different toothpaste companies are trying to sell you different toothpaste, and it's a, you know, largely competitive market, and then every once in a while there's an externality that requires government intervention, and then you get, you know, these weird things like, you know, the, the too big to fail banks or whatever, but, you know, those are the exceptions to the general working of the free market system. You know, look, I can tell you my experience, having been now in startups for 30 years, is that the opposite is true. true. Um, specifically, that James Burnham was right, um, that we passed from, you know, the original model of capitalism, which he called bourgeois capitalism, which is what we still think capitalism is, we passed into a different model, which he called managerial capitalism, uh, you know, some, some decades back. Um, and the, 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 the actual correct model of how the U.S. economy works is it is mostly a process of oligopolies, cartels, and monopolies. Um, and they most it's it's mostly them you know for it's basically big companies forming up in oligopolies cartels and monopolies um, and doing all the things that you expect oligopolies cartels and monopolies to do um, and then they jointly basically corrupt and capture the regulatory and, and government process and so they they end up controlling their regulators um, and so most sectors of the economy are a conspiracy between the big incumbents and their putative regulators. Um, and the purpose of the conspiracy is to perpetuate the long-term existence of those monopolies and cartels um, and to block uh, new competition. Uh, like, so, so, so that's, where, that's where I've come out on. Um, to me, that completely explains the education system, both K through 12 and the college university system. It completely explains the healthcare system. It completely explains the housing crisis. It completely explains 2008, the financial crisis and the bailouts. Uh, it completely explains the Twitter files. Like I think that's precisely what, ha what what has been happening in tech, um, and so if if you're if you're if you're if you're if you're open to that interpretation of how the world works and how the country works and how the economy works, then uh, like a lot of things start to make a tremendous amount of sense. Um, and then I, you know I think that what the Twitter files is is it's basically an X-ray of of a specific instance of that happening, um, which and, and this is just factual. What we now know from the Twitter files is that a very large number of people in government, by the way, some of them political and you know some of them like p politicians. But also some of them bureaucrats, right? Uh, and so some of the members of the right deep state, right? Which either, you know, as we know, the deep state either does not exist, or if it does exist, it's good, right? One or the other. Um, um, I, I think most people. That's what I've heard. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, that's what I've heard. There's a recent book on that that uh, apparently makes that case very, very clearly. Um, so let's just say like the permanent bureaucracy, uh, or, or again, what James Burnham would say is like the managerial class in government, right? The sort of permanent uh, cadre of professionals in government who basically manage everything. Um, and, you know, those people and then also people on the outside who they fund as their proxies, right, with government money, with taxpayer money, right, have been exerting enormous pressure um, on Twitter um, to block, censor, dot, 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 you know, and, and, you know, what looks to me like a straightforward constitutional case for a deprivation of constitutional rights, you know, first, fourth and fifth amendments. Um, in a way that is clearly illegal, um, both under the Constitution and under, uh, is it uh, uh, Title 18, uh, whatever, 242, uh, you know, there's a specific federal law that says there, it's, a felon, it's a felony for a government official to use the power of being in government uh, to deny citizens of constitutional rights. Um, there's actually, by the way, another law, there's 241, that actually applies that same principle to private citizens, including private companies. Um, and so I think it's possible that there has there actually I think it's possible that there's actually been criminal activity both on the government side and on the company side. Um, and yeah, and it's just like, yeah, that's been happening. And, you know, the Twitter, every new drop of the Twitter files shows that that's what's what's been happening, you know, in a in a in a non-political world where we all just like read the Constitution. Um, you know, this would be a constitutional crisis. You know, this would be the biggest story in the, in the country. There would be hearings. You know, there would be, you know, among other, you know, immediate impeachment proceedings like, you know, this this would be a five alarm fire. Right, because obviously the government can't be allowed to do this. Um, you know, in our, in our, in our, in the real world, of course, that's not what's happening. Um, and you know, and we're back to either e either denial or 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 embrace under the theory that this is good and proper. Right. Um, are there sectors that are less subject to that dynamic that you just described, in which the startup quickly become the incumbent semester of the state? I mean, look, so I think it's, so my, my theory basically is, it's, it, it, the question is always the same question, like, is there actual competition, right? Like, so, so, so actually, I think there's like a deeper, my, my deeper idea here is, is basically the process of evolution. Like, so the idea of capitalism is basically an economic form of the idea of evolution, right? And natural selection and the, you know, and survival of the fittest and the idea that basically it's a superior product ought to win in the market um, and that markets ought to, ought to be open to competition and a better, you know, a new company can come along with a better widget and take out the incumbents because its widget is superior and customers like it better. And so 
so like for, for evolution to proper to, to, to function properly, you need survival of the fittest, which means you need things to die when they're not the best thing. For capitalism to work properly, you need the same thing to happen. You need companies to die when they are inferior to other companies that are doing things better. Right. That that, you know, that's that that's sort of inherent to the to, to the thing. And so the, 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 the question always is, like, is there actual competition happening or not? Right. Is, is and, you know, in part is like, do consumers actually have the ability to freely select among the existing alternatives? And then the other question is, like, can, can, can new can new products actually come to market? Right. You know, can you can you actually bring a new widget to market or do you get blocked out because the regulatory wall that's been established is, you know, basically makes that prohibitive. I mean, look, the, the great example of this is 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 banking. Right. Where, you know, the, the big thing in 2008 was we need to bail out these banks because they're, quote unquote, too big to fail. And so then there were screams of the need to reform the too big to fail banks that led to Dodd-Frank. The result of Dodd-Frank, I call it the Big Bank Protection Act of 2011. Uh, right. The, the, the result of that is that the too big to fail banks are now much larger than before. Um, and the number of new banks being created in the U.S. has dropped to zero. Right. Because it's, it's now effectively impossible to launch a new bank in the U.S. because, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase has 10,000 lawyers. Right. Working on their regulatory issues. And you have one like it, it's it's not possible. Like you, you can't start new banks anymore. Um, and so anyway, sorry. So I'm, I'm, I'm repeating the uh, I'm repeating the case against. Um, so but the question is, like, where is that not happening? Like, you know, where where, where in the where in the market is that actually not happening? Um, you know, where, where is there free and open competition? You know, look, the, the, the cynical answer is this, it's not that doesn't happen in the spaces that don't matter. Right. Like so toys like anybody can bring a new toy to market like it's fine sure great right anybody can you know i don't know like anybody can open a restaurant right it's i mean i would say don't matter being like you know these are fine and good like you know consumer categories that people really enjoy and so forth but as contrasted to the healthcare system or the education system right or the housing system right or if the you legal want freedom, your What's business that? better be frivolous. if you want freedom your business better be frivolous i mean that would be the, that would be the cynical way of looking at it like if if it if it doesn't matter from a societal structure right in terms of like determining the power structure of society and basically the power of the government in society um, then yeah go crazy do whatever you want but like if it actually matters to like major issues of policy right where the government is intertwined with them then of course it doesn't happen there and, and again it doesn't happen there not just because of the government it doesn't happen there because of an intertwining of the incumbents in the government you know, look, I, I think this stuff is getting, look, I, this is one of these things where I, I almost have trouble debating it. I mean, not debating it with you, but like debating it with people who argue with me on this, because I think it's so self-evident. It's like, well, why aren't there, you know, it's like, why are all these universities like identical? Like, why are all of the major universities implementing the exact same like crazy, like, why do they all have like identical ideologies, right? Why, why isn't there like, a, why isn't there a marketplace of ideas at the, at the university level? Right. And it's like, well, that becomes a question of like, why aren't there more universities? OK, well, why, uh, and I can tell you why there aren't more universities. There aren't more universities because to be a new university, you have to get accredited. Uh, the accreditation um, uh, bureau uh, is is run by the existing universities. Like it, 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 it's sitting there in plain sight. I'll give you the other another example. Why do healthcare prices do what they do? Right. Why 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 do healthcare prices work the way that they work? A major reason for that. Um, is because um, they because basically they're they're paid for by insurance. Um, there's private insurance and public insurance. The private insurance prices just key off the public prices because Medicare basically drives the whole thing because M Medicare is the, the big buyer. Um, so how are Medicare prices set? They're set by a unit inside HHS called CMS, um, and, uh, and and CMS runs literal Soviet style price fixing boards uh, for medical goods and services. Um, and so once a year, there are doctors who get together in a conference room at like a Hyatt in Chicago somewhere. Um, and they sit down and they establish, they fix, they do the exact same thing that what was the unit of, uh, the, the, the communist party in, in the, in, the, in Russia that used to do this in the Soviet union. Um, there's a term for it. There was the, the central price fixing bureau. Um, mm -hmm. right. So the Soviets had a central price fixing bureau. It didn't work. <laughs> We don't have that for the entire economy, but we have that for the entire healthcare system, right? And it doesn't work for the same reason that the Soviet system didn't work, right? And so we've exactly replicated the Soviet system. We're expecting better results. It operates in plain sight. You can go on the Medi CMS. CMS has a website. They'll explain this all to you. It's operating in plain sight. Everybody thinks it's a great idea. And, and then, you know, lots of people are calling for, you know, increased government, you know, centralized, you know, control and purchasing of healthcare, which would make that system stronger. And so it's like, we, we know that this is not going to work. We know that it's going to only result in restrictions of supply and, and rising prices. We know precisely what the outcome is going to be. We seem perfectly happy with it, and then we complain about it. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to pivot a little bit and ask, um, sort of in this vein of you know, everyone is trying to build a system that does good, and they seem to want the government to do it all the time, but um, a little bit differently. 
what has made money for you or for your investors that you think has also done the most to make the world a better place? Oh, I, I mean, it, it's even hard to. I mean, we all we all have a we all have a narrative on that. Like, yeah. pick, <laughs> my, pick my, one, pick your favorite among your all your children. My narrative is spectacular. So, um, I mean, look, basically, material progress only ever happens through technology. Like, there's basically only two ways to make material progress on planet Earth. There's only two reasons why we're not all living in mud huts, right, and subsistence farming all day, which is what we used to do, right, which is what our, our predecessors did. And there's only two reasons. One is natural resource extraction, right, um, and then the other is technology. And, and those are the only two. Those are the only two levers on the world, right? They're, those are the only two ways to raise standard standard of living. It's it's, it's the, they're the only possibilities. Um, and so, and you know, natural resource extraction is good up to a point, but like at some point, you know, you, at some point you need to do something with the resources, and so that that immediately also becomes an application of technology. Um, and so, you know, on the materialist side, right, which is the the obvious, the more obvious one, which is is just standard of living. You know, standard of living in the U.S. is up like eight x in the last you know, whatever it is, 75 years or some crazy number like that. Like it, it is true, you know, the, the engine of technology routinely is producing, you know, enhancements to standard of living. And, 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 and of course, there are the thought experiments very easy, which is, you know, you know, notwithstanding whatever problems people have with, you know, current modernity or post-modernity or whatever we're living in, like, w would you switch places with, you know, your predecessor 50 years ago, you know, from, from a material well-being standpoint? And, you know, the answer to that for basically everybody is is is, is no, uh, and of course we also know that because you know you could build cities and towns today if you wanted to where people voluntarily you know didn't use technology made after 1950 or something and you know <laughs> the Amish do that but like you know nobody else does it, um, and so it, you know material standards of living um, are you know continue to advance um, I, I think that that and I think that's a perfectly fine and good argument and then I, and then look I also think the other side I, from in terms of my my philosophy there's like a human freedom right and and, and flourishing aspect to it like the you know, the sort of intellectual or maybe even the spiritual side. And, you know, there is just like, okay, like, are people more free to like learn and explore um, and express themselves and be themselves and find like-minded people, right? Um, and discover their calling in life, right? Um, and, you know, you know, if they're creating something, bring their creation to market um, and find the audience for it um, or the market for it. Like, you know, all of the, like the ability of sort of humans to self-actualize. Like, is, is that expanding over time or diminishing over time? And I, and I think, like, overwhelmingly, the impact of the Internet has been to expand that. Now, there is this, you know, giant war that's happening where there's lots of people who are trying to, like, shut that, you know, shut aspects of that down and control that. But nevertheless, I think, I th I think everybody would sort of have to concede, like, the Internet has made it much more possible for a much broader, you know, range of voices, a much broader range of ideas. I mean, I, I, you know, I read and see things on the Internet today that, like, you know, 25 years ago, you know, you would have been in a card, you know, you would, have, you would have had to go deep into the card catalog at some, you know, giant university campus if you could have gotten access to it to find some book that was written in like 1820 or something, you know, and today it's just like tap, 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 Google search. Oh, I can, you know, I can find out all, all, all you know, I can find out all about this and then I, and then I can write about it myself. Um, and so, I, yeah, I, you know, people, people, it, people actually do have like a much greater level of, let's say, personal freedom. Um, you know, look, having said that, like the war to try to control that and choke that off is also very real. What do you think is a better use of time and resources, trying to start a company or giving away money to a wor the worthiest cause? Oh, I, I mean, I think overwhelmingly the former. Um, <laughs> so overwhelmingly the former. So, and, and this is, and this is an argument, right, that very, very few people in our modern, you know, kind of society, modern, you know, whatever um, civil religion are, are willing to make, but, you know, I'll, I'll make it, which is the production is a good of itself, right? Like, the, you know, the person who makes your toothpaste is doing, you know, the company that makes your toothpaste is, is doing something for you right, that is superior to that of, you know, most you know, people doing health philanthropy, right? Like it, production of the goods and services that make our lives better, um, right? And, and, and at the limit, you know, the goods and services that like cure diseases and so forth, you know, they're, they're, they're generally for-profit companies. The fact that they make money on those things is just reward for having improved the world. Um, you know, I think most, most of the actual like material progress in the world, most of the, most of the improvement in human welfare is, is done through, through for-profit production. Um, so, so, I, so I've, 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 I, you know, I'm, you know, there are people who are like basically capitalism, you know, building a company is a necessary evil to generate the money with which we can then make the world better. I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not the case. Like most of the good you're going to do in the world is going to be through building your company. And then maybe you're going to find a way to do some philanthropy thing. You know, hopefully the philanthropy thing that you do is not going to make the world worse and not better, which is often a, an interesting question. Um, here's the other reason I believe that so strongly, which is, and again, this, let's assume some sort of properly functioning capitalism, right, with some level of effective competition in the market. You know, production in the for-profit system, like the products succeed or fail, they're adopted or they're not adopted on the basis of whether people want them, right, and whether people think that they make their lives better and people want to engage in that trade. 
Um, and so there's like a, there's like a there's a there's a direct reality test with every transaction, right, as to whether this is actually something that people want and whether this is something that people think will will improve their lives. You know, there is this massive issue with philanthropy, which has always been an issue and it continues to be an issue, which is it's just it's not subject to a market test. Um, and so and there are, you know, reams and reams and reams of examples and studies of philanthropic programs that, you know, thought that they were going to, you know, you know, lead to benefit, you know, lead to some sort of beneficial outcome in some area. Um, and then it turned out they, you know, backfire horribly. Right. And, you know, th there's an obvious one just kind of staring us all in our face today, which is, you know, criminal justice reform. Right. You know, there's been this wave of philanthropists, many of whom I know over the course of the last 20 years who have, you know, spent an enormous amount of money putting in place a new set of politicians and a new set of, of, of political ideas that have resulted in letting the criminals out of jail and as a, con you know, for, for justice. Uh, and as a consequence, like crime is through the roof and it's like not safe to be in the streets. And it's, it's just like, but like there's no market test, like the, the people who have spent all of that money, right, to let all the criminals out like they're not subject to the risk of all the criminals being out because they all have like Navy SEAL teams protecting them, right? Because they're all like rich, <laughs> right? Um, and so they're able to just like arbitrarily like ruin society, um, you know, through philanthropic efforts with no corrective mechanism whatsoever. Um, and so I, I you know, if, if anything, the world we're in today, like the dichotomy between like the actual good of production and then the actual evil of sort of the unintended consequences of sort of untested quote unquote philanthropy, like I, I think those are gapping out in a pretty profound way. Um, again, it's hard for me to even talk about this with most people because I just I think it's kind of obvious. It's like walk down the street in San Francisco. It's pretty obvious what's happening. And yet, like the level of denial among a lot of people I talked to about this is like through the roof. So there's also the kind of um, I mean, this sometimes shows up in the kind of effective altruist critique, right, where you say, well, you know, why why give to the opera when people are dying of malaria? Right. That's the sort of old, the previous effective altruist critique, I guess. Um, what do you give to, if anything? Well, by the way, the, the, the malaria thing, this, this goes to the na nature of the problem, right? The nature of the philanthropy problem, the nature of the effective altruism problem, which is, right, okay, fair enough. Like, don't give to the opera because people are, are dying of malaria. It's okay. What do we do to keep people from dying from malaria? Well, we give the bed nets, right? And the bed nets are, like, treated with chemicals that, like, pre you know, prevent the mosquitoes from, from being able to, um, you know, to be able to, you know, to, to spread malaria. Okay. But now we've given people, you know, nets that are treated with chemicals, and then they turn around. And they use those nets to go fishing, but they use the, you know, there's, and then the chemical treatment on the nets ruins, 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 ruins the fishing environment, right? Like, and now people starve, right? And it's like, and by the way, maybe that happens and maybe it doesn't, but like it's happening 8,000 miles away, <laughs> right? In a way that you're never going to even know like what's happening. And so these like cosmic big brain utilitarian EA ideas that people are going to like have an Excel spreadsheet where they're going to figure this stuff out or they're going to sit on the camp, you know, campus at Stanford or Oxford or something and have these ideas that it's going to translate into the real world. I mean, my favorite example, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but my favorite example I keep trying to get all my friends to read um, is the Moynihan report um, from 1965. So, right, Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote this report um, about the rate of, of, of uh, single uh, parenthood um, in the U.S. Uh, in 1965. And he sort of, and a lot of social scientists will tell you like a, a huge number of life, life outcomes at the very least correlate to whether you grew up in a, in a, in a double parent or single parent home. Um, and so the Moynihan, you know, Moynihan was like the leading light of like the liberal progressive, you know, reform movement in 1965 with LBJ with the Great Society. And he had the full resources of the government, you know, like a limited capability consultation with experts. And he wrote this report and it was like, we have this huge crisis because of the percentage of, of unwed, uh, you know, births. Um, and then as a consequence, we're going to implement all of these incredible programs, both government programs and philanthropic programs, you know, to fix this. And then fast forward, you know, sitting here today, 50 years later, um, you know, the, 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 the percentage of unwed births has tripled, right? And, and, right. And by, by the way, with no accounting, right? Like with no accounting, no accountability, he's dead. He doesn't have to live with the consequences. Nobody's looking at this. Nobody cares. You know, I don't, maybe you guys write a story on it or Fox News, you know, somebody does it, but like nobody cares. Like, and, and, and those programs continue on autopilot forever. Um, and so I, I just, you know, I just find it's like this remote control aspect to it. It's just like incredibly disturbing. Um, it doesn't work. And, by, and again, I go back to this is the thing, like any business, any for-profit business cannot, any legitimate for-profit business that operates in a true competitive market cannot do this. The, the market will prevent them from doing this because if they do this, the market will stop them. From, the market will say, no, I do not want you to do this anymore. I will not buy this thing anymore. Right. And you will go away. Right. And, and, there, and there's there's no equivalent pressure whatsoever on a, on a foundation or, or, or a philanthropist. So so anyway, what do we do? So specifically what we do is we, we basically stick very, very, very close to home. Um, and specifically what we do is basically lo local social infrastructure. And in particular, we, we do emergency medicine. Um, and so we do, um, and, and specifically at, at, uh, at Stanford. So, um, you know, we, we, we basically fund 
run Stanford Emergency Medicine, the whole program there. Um, and, and, you know, basically under, under a couple of theories, number one is, you know, it, whatever you feel about our healthcare system, it is true that at three in the morning, you know, when your kid has a fever of 105 or, you know, somebody, you know, has a serious problem, um, you know, everybody's kind of equal at the ER at three in the morning. Um, and so, you know, it, it is the ultimate backstop for, uh, you know, for medical care for everybody. Um, and then the other is like any given day, I can go sit in, in the ER and I can see the patients, right? And I can see the outcomes, right? And I, and I don't have to wonder whether like this is a good idea or a bad idea. Like I, I can see the benefit. Like there, there's no remote control aspect to it at all. It's like, it's like right there. Um, you know, it's like 10 minutes from my house. Um, and so, you know, that, that's the kind of thing we do. And it's to at least try to live up to the spirit of, let's say, trying to make the world a better place, but also trying to do it in a way where we can actually prove that we're actually doing that. You know, you said, I think about 10 years ago now, um, that Bitcoin is as important as the internet was. Um, sure. And we've had a little time for that to play out. Um, it's been tumultuous. Yep. Um, but I guess on the theme of this time, it's different. How is that prediction looking to you? You've done pretty well financially with your investments in that space, uh, but not everyone has. Yeah, well, so there's a bunch of things. So <laughs> there's a bunch of things in there. So, so just the the thesis of what I wrote then, which I, I still believe. So the, the the I wrote this piece as a New York Times column. It was a New York Times column back when the New York Times would run things that I write. Which, by the way, <laughs> in case you're wondering, is no longer true. Um, but they ran it at the time. Um, and uh, and so everything in there, I still agree with. The, the one modification I would make is I at the time it looked like Bitcoin was going to evolve and Bitcoin itself was going to evolve in a way where it was going to be used for many other things. Uh, we, we at the time thought it was a general technology platform that was going to evolve to be to be able to make a lot of other applications possible in the same way that the internet did and the same way the iPhone did and so forth. Um, it actually turned out that didn't that didn't happen. Bitcoin itself just basically stalled out. It, it, it basically stopped evolving. Um, but what happened was a, 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 a bunch of other projects emerged that sort of took that place. And, the, and the, you know, the big one right now is Ethereum um, is sort of the is sort of the next derivation. And so if, if I wrote that thing today, I would either say Ethereum instead of Bitcoin or I would just say crypto you know, or Web3 instead of Bitcoin. But, but otherwise, it, all, the same ideas, uh, all the same ideas apply. Um, you know, look, the argument I made in that piece that I 100% believe today is basically, it, it, and, and well, I'm going to use the terms kind of interchangeably, like crypto, Web3, blockchain, or, or use those terms kind of interchangeably. Um, they're the other, they're, they're what I call the other half of the internet, the internet. They're, they're the other, it's the other, it's all the functions of the internet that we knew that we wanted to have when we originally built the internet, as people know it today, and the web as people know it today. But it's all of the it's all the aspects of basically being able to like do business and be able to have money and be able to do transactions and have trust. Like we did not know how to use the internet to do that in the '90s, and now with this technological breakthrough of the blockchain, we now know how to do that. We have we have the technological foundation to be able to do that. Um, and so and and the, that there is basically as follows, which is basically have a have a have a network of trust, a digital trust that, that is overlaid on top of the internet, which is an untru internet's an untrusted network. Anybody can pretend to be anybody they want on the internet. Anybody can hook up to the internet, do whatever they want. Right? It's famously untrusted. Um, Crypto Web3 creates layers of trust on top of that. And then within those layers of trust, you can represent money, uh, but you can also represent many other things. You can represent claims of ownership. You can, you know, so you could represent everything from house titles, car titles, you know, insurance contracts, loans. Um, you can represent claims to digital assets. You can have things like unique digital art. Um, you can have, um, you know, all you, you can have a, a general concept of like an internet contract. You can actually strike contracts with people online, um, you know, that they're, that they're actually held to. Um, you know, just an example, you can have like internet escrow services. Like, so for e-commerce, you can have a service, you have a, two people buying, you know, from each other, you can have actually a trusted intermediary now that is internet native that has an escrow service. So, so it's, it's like, basically it's like you can build on top of the untrusted internet, all of the capabilities that you would need to have a full economy, um, right. And sort of the broadest definition of that, you, you, in other words, like a full global internet native economy. Um, and you know, that's a giant, I mean, that's a giant idea. You know, the, the potential there is, is, is extraordinarily high. Um, and so, yeah, we're, you know, we're midway through that process. We have, you know, funded and there's lots of others, but like, there's tons of really smart entrepreneurs who are basically going after every aspect of what I just described. Um, you know, a lot of those things have worked, you know, some of those things haven't worked yet, but I think that they're going to work. Um, you know, look, having said that these things are, you know, ev every new thing we do is by definition, you know, it's called venture capital for a reason, like these are ventures, you know, you can add the prefix AD, these are adventures, um, you know, these are, you know, the big question people always ask us is like, are, are you are you speculating? And I'm always like, well, I, 
you know, it's like, I don't even know what speculating is. Like, am I investing in something without knowing how it's going to go? Yes. Is that speculation? Yes. Is that every investment? Yes. Like, yes, you know, we're investing in a future unknown state. Like, you know, sometimes these things work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes the prices go up, sometimes the prices go down. Um, we never make price predictions. Um, you know, we never predict that Bitcoin price or whatever is going to be X or Y or Z at any given point. I have good friends of mine who still haven't gotten the message on this and they still call me up and they're like, Mark, what's Bitcoin price going to be next month? And I'm like, I don't, <laughs> it beats me, man. You know, go look in the chicken entrails. Like, I don't, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Um, so the prices are going to whip, you know, the prices whip around, you know, through the process of the market trying to establish value. Um, crypto looks more volatile than a lot of other categories just because the assets sort of list publicly in advance of, you know, when we back a private company, it usually doesn't go public for, if it goes public, it'll go public like seven or eight or 10 years later. Um, crypto projects, crypto tokens start to float much earlier than that. So it's, it's almost as if startup equity was being traded in the public market from the very beginning. You know, of course, those prices would be highly volatile. Right. A, a, a critique of venture capital is that we present to our investors, people accuse us of presenting to our inv investors what looks like artificially su uh, suppressed volatility because uh, the prices of the things that we invest in, like in actuality, if they were trading on the public market, they'd be whipping all over the place. But we just hold them privately. We mark them once a quarter. We don't even know what they're worth then. We just let the accountants like make some guess. Um, so whereas these crypto assets just they trade publicly. So. Um, so, so they look more volatile. I actually don't think they're more, more volatile than the other stuff that we do. I think that this is just all, this is just the nature of doing things that are new and speculative. We never recommend people invest in anything. Like if people want to invest in crypto assets, they should, but they should understand that the level of volatility is going to be very high. And I, I think the same thing would be true of anything, quite honestly, that they invest in. I want to talk about the kids these days, since you mentioned uh, unwed pregnancies. Yes. And, um, you know, those numbers, certainly like teen pregnancy numbers recently are down quite a bit. Um, some people take that as, um, evidence that maybe the kids are not all right. Um, they're on their phones all the time and they're not having human interactions or something. And so it's bad news that the kids aren't having sex and doing drugs. Um, what, how are the kids these days? Are the kids all right? Are, you know, you sort of mentioned earlier, education is one of those sectors that is very, very locked down, very, very limited in terms of innovation, hard to break into, um, so how, how are the kids doing? And uh, if not well, what can be done? Well, some of the kids are pretty messed up. Like, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know if you've been noticing, but some of the kids seem to have some issues. So I, I will, I'll concede up front, like there do seem to be some problems. Um, so let's see, a whole bunch of things in there. Um, so yeah, so, so first off, I'll say like just the enormous irony. I feel like there's enormous irony. So when I was a kid, you know, so I'm, I, I was a kid in the 80s. And when I was a kid, it was this constant like moral panic um, constant media pressure of like the kids were like totally out of control. Right. Yep. And, it, and it was, it was literally like the kids are all on drugs and the kids are all having like casual sex and like the kids are basically spiraling into nihilism and, 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 uh, you know, and sort of self-destruction. Um, and so I, I will, I will concede there is a lot of irony to be sitting here today. And now there's this other critique from the same, at least the same kind of person basically saying, Oh, the kids aren't doing enough drugs and having enough sex. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> what do you want? What do you want? You, you told us to stop doing those things and we did. Okay. So, um, yeah. So look, you know, there's, there's deeper, deeper questions underneath that. Um, you know, look, the, the birth rate question, I mean, I, I'm sure you know this, but like the, the birth rate thing, like birth rates are crashing all over the world, right? So it, the most interesting thing about the birth rate phenomenon, um, and I, by the way, I think it's great that Elon, you know, has been talking about this in public and really elevating this because it's a really big, it's a really big question. Um, but like birth rates are crashing in the US, birth rates are also crashing in Europe, and they're also crashing in Japan, and they're also crashing in Korea. And now they're also now crashing in China. Uh, and they're crashing and they're crashing in Iran. Right. And so, like, whatever is happening is not happening because of, quote unquote, you know, whatever American, you know, this, that or the other thing or even Western, you know, or, or at least not like, you know, just kind of facially like whatever is unique or special or different about Western culture. Like it, it, this is a broad based phenomenon. You know, I, I you know, I'm not an expert in the thing. Um, you know, the, the sort of best analyses I've read seem to in indicate that it's more or less a natural consequence of, you know, much, much kind of a combination of like much longer periods of education, uh, sort of coupled with much higher levels of female engagement, both in the education system and in the workforce. Um, and if you sort of fully empower everybody, both, you know, men and women to kind of fully self-actualize in the form of basically unlimited amounts of education coupled by unlimited professional opportunities. Um, you basically, it's like what I was saying earlier, it's like you, you just make life more interesting for people um, in a way where, you know, they're perfectly happy running through their 20s and 30s, you know, without the obligations that come with having children. And then, of course, by the time they decide they want to have children, you know, if they're in their mid or late 30s, it might already be too late. 
Um, so I, I just go through that to say, like, I, I don't even know, is that good or bad? I don't know. Um, is it Western or Eastern? I, it seems to be both. I mean, the China one is fascinating. Like, you know, the numbers just came out. The birth rate in China is crashing even faster than expected. You know, it, it looks like they may already have passed their demographic peak, um, right, where, where from, from here on out, the Chinese population may only age. Right. And, and by the way, if you think we have a, you know, to people to people who think we have a problem with the birth rate, like right. the Chinese have a the Chinese have a real problem because like, it, you know, it's one thing or you contrast like Japan and China. Right. Like Japan has a lot of old people, but it's extraordinarily wealthy society um, because of all the economic development development that happened between like 1950 and and uh, and, and the present, like into basically a, a society as economically advanced as ours or maybe even more so. Um, you know, China's not that. China's still in the middle income zone, um, you know, sort of 5,000 per capita GDP or something like that. Um, th th there's no economics on earth that can explain how they're going to take care of all their old people, um, you know, in, in the time frame that they have to get ready for that. Um, so, yeah, this seems to be like a big issue. I mean, look, are we going to reverse any of this? Like, are we going to, you know, go back to a model where people, you know, don't have all these years of education? You know, maybe, by the way, maybe we should. We're probably not going to. Um, are we going to, you know, deprive, you know, women of the professional opportunities they have, you know, to go back to an era where they don't have those opportunities? Probably not. Um, are we going to, um, you know, uh, what else? Are we, are we going to become less, you know, progress, you know, sort of socially progressive um, and, you know, elevate motherhood more as sort of a social good? Pro you know, probably not. Um, <laughs> that doesn't seem to be in the cards. Um, you know, another possibility here is are we going to have scientific breakthroughs? Right. So, you know, this this everything I've, we've talked about up until now is sort of assumed that sort of the natural progress of, of, of human birth and reproduction, the old fashioned way. Um, you know, look, are we going to have, you know, cloning of embryos? Are we going to have, you know, external, you know, gestation machines? Um, you know, are, are we going to be able to ha are we going to have uh, embryos created by, from stem cells? Right. Um, such that, you know, you, you can, you know, if you, you could you could decide on your 60, it's time to have a new baby and you could, you know, have it. You have the have the embryo cloned off your stem cells and then have it, you know, have the baby raised in a, in a gestation tank for nine months. And the outcomes, the other end comes a, a baby like maybe um, is that, you know, are those technologies being developed now? Yes. Are they going to freak people out? Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. You know, are, are, they, are, are they necessary for the perpetuation of the species? Quite possibly. Yeah, so this, this is kind of my temptation always is to say we are going to technologically innovate our way out of our sociocultural problems. And yeah. it obviously doesn't always work like that. But I mean, you've said the future relies on 19 year olds and the startups that no one's ever heard of yet. And those 19 year olds are going to have to come from somewhere. Right. Um, maybe we don't need to go all the way to like growing them you know, growing them in a vat uh, from stem cells, but it might help if what we need is kind of peak weird 19 year old to get through this, right? Yeah, look, there, there's that question. And then look, there's another giant question that's coming up right behind that, which is, you know, the, the sort of the big genetic engineering question, right? And so like, for, for example, like this is not on the horizon right now, but like there's very, very, you know, um, uh, cutting edge work happening in the genomics field. Uh, to identify all the genes that are associated with intelligence, um, right? And there's, it's already, we're up to like, it's like, we already are up to like 200 genes um, that correlate to like half of IQ. Um, and so, you know, it, let's, ass let's assume we're moving into a world in which we're increasingly going to be engineering babies, which I think is a real possibility for the reasons we just discussed. Um, are we also going to be optimizing them, right? Like, are we going to be like, you know, is there going to be a CRISPR treatment that you can just dial up and order in 10 or 20 years, you know, where you can give your, you know, you can give your uh, stem cell, you know, clone uh, embryo a 20 or 30 point IQ boost, right? Right. And so, and so, so maybe on the other side of this are like, you know, these sort of super babies, right. Um, where we come out the other side of this and we sort of technically engineer ourselves, you know, not just the perpetuation of the species, but like an upgrade of the species where all of a sudden the babies are all coming out like much, much smarter. Right. Um, and then, you know, as a consequence, they're able to, you know, do all kinds of things better, you know, kind of through their lives. Like, you know, so, so maybe there's a technological utopia on the other side of this. Um, you know, on the other hand, maybe this is some sort of catastrophic moral, you know, philosophical civilizational collapse, right? Where we've given up on sort of the inherent spirit of what it means to be human. Um, and we're going to use, you know, we're just in like terminal decline. Um, and we're, you know, we're going to use technology, you know, so sort of the cyberpunk view of it. We're going to use, you know, technology as sort of the band aid, you know, to kind of cover up what, what otherwise is kind of, you know, a hard crash. Right. I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. I will say, like, these issues are real. Like, these issues are real and they're forming up. And, you know, everything you and I just talked about, like, it's all real. It's all going to happen. Um, and these are very big questions. And, you know, either people do not want to talk about them today or they totally freak people out. People get really mad. Um, so at, at least I, I have yet to read or hear a, 
I don't know, I guess what I would say is a clear, dispassionate, non-ideological, like, you know, full summation of all this, like, um, uh, and yeah, maybe one of People are bringing that. a lot of priors into this conversation. It's a little hard to. to yes. Yeah. Um, yep, exactly. are, those, are those sectors where you think, um, where you think that there's currently the right amount of investment, insufficient investment, too much investment because there's hype? Where are we? Where are we there? Yeah, so probably well, so investment. So, uh, so, um, the, so the real answer to the question is there's actually two kinds of technology investment, and they're actually very different. Um, so there's, you know, the, the term that gets used is called research and development, but really those mm -hmm. are two different things. So there's research and then there's development, and those are those are two different things. And so, the, the research is basically funding into scientific research, and, and and basically what that means is funding into you know really smart people pursuing like really deep you know questions around technology and science, um, you know, such that you know they may not even know what you know, they, they may not have any idea yet of what commercial relevance or what kind of product could get built on it or even whether something can work, right? Um, and so, um, you know, it's, it's the classic classic concept of basic research. Um, and then there's the other side of it, which is what we do, which is the development side, right? Um, and so the way we think about it is by the time we fund a company to build a product, like the basic research has to be finished already. Like there, there can't be open basic research questions because otherwise you have a startup that you don't even know whether the thing will ever actually be able, you know, even be able to build a thing. Um, but then also like it needs to be close enough to uh, a commercialization that, you know, within like five years or something, you can actually commercialize it into a product. So so anyway, it's, it's sort of fairly well understood that like those, those are the two sides of things. Um, you know, that formula worked really well in the computer industry. Um, so there was 50 years of basically government research into information science, computer science. Um, you know, during and after World War II, and then that translated to the computer industry, software industry, internet, and that worked. By the way, that also worked in biotech, right? And so that worked for, um, you know, NIH, you know, had a, this big sort of sustained research, biomedical research program that resulted in the biotech industry, which, you know, most recently resulted in things like the mRNA vaccine. So, like, that worked. Um, you know, those research programs continue. Um, you know, th those are the two main areas of, I think, actual productive research happening. So those are the two main areas where we can get results off the other side. You know, should there be more funding in the basic research? I mean, almost certainly um, there should be. Um, you know, look, having said that, the basic research world has a very profound crisis underway right now, which is this, this they call the replication crisis, uh, which is it, it turns out that a lot of what people thought was basic research has actually just basically been fake um, and, and, and arguably fraud. And so there, there is a, among the many problems that our modern universities have, there is a very big problem where most of the research that they're doing does seem to be fake. Um, and so, you know, it's like, what, would, would you recommend more money to be put into a system and that's just generating fake results? No. Um, would you though argue that like, you do need basic research to continue to get new products out the other end? Yes. So like <laughs> that problem ought to get dealt with. Um, maybe it's starting <laughs> to get, maybe it's starting to get dealt with very slowly on the development side. I'm probably more optimistic. I think, yeah, generally, like I would say, generally, we don't lack for money, which is to say the venture capital industry, like my industry, venture capital funding of startups and funding of new tech, uh, like we're, we, I would say we as a sector have plenty of money. There's plenty of investors who want to invest. Um, you know, the companies seem to get perfectly well funded. Um, I think basically all the good entrepreneurs get funded. Um, I think that, um, you know, all the good companies get funded. I, I, I don't think there's a shortage of money there. Um, the main question on that side of things is not so much the money. The main question goes back to our question about competition and how markets work, which is in what fields of economic activity can there actually be startups, right? Um, and so, if, and specifically, for example, like, can you actually have education startups? Can you actually have healthcare startups? Can you actually have housing startups? Um, or will they, can you actually have financial services startups? Can you actually, can you actually do a new bank? Like, can you do a new online bank that like works in a different way? And you know, for, for, for those fields where you would want to see like a lot of progress, the, the bottleneck is not whether we can fund them. The bottleneck is literally whether the companies will be allowed to exist. Um, and so on, on that side of things, that, 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 that's what I would focus on. And yet I think there are sometimes places where you might have said, listen, it's settled wisdom that you can't have a startup in this area. Um, and then it turns out you can. And I, I'm thinking here, I guess, of space. Um, I'm thinking of um, maybe, you know, maybe to some extent in um, some subsets of education. And of course, also, um, I would put crypto in this category. You know, what? how can you compete with money? Um, and then here we are uh, in a quite robust competitive market that is trying to compete with money. Um, what, how do you, how do you go from actually competition doesn't look very possible in that space to someone tries it? 
Yeah, so SpaceX is probably the best, you know, SpaceX is probably your best case scenario. I mean, you could talk about crypto also as an example, but like, so let's just take SpaceX as an example, right? So, you know, I mean, talk about a market that's like dominated by the government and like has regula regulations to the moon, literally to the, to the moon, um, right? Like, you know, uh, you know, there has not, you know, it's one of these things there have not, now, I don't even know the last time anybody tried to do a new launch platform. Um, and then the idea that you're going to put all these satellites up there, like there's massive regulatory issues around that. So, um, and then just like the complexity, of, you know, on top of that, you know, you, he, you know, Elon wanted the rockets to be reusable. So he wanted them to like land on their rear ends. Right. Which is like something that people thought was impossible. Right. Um, you know, all previous rockets, you basically they're, they're one shot and they're done. Um, whereas his rockets get reused over and over again because they're able to land themselves. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, look, if SpaceX climbed a wall of, um, you know, skepticism its entire way and like he basically just like brute forced his way through it and, and you know, he and the team there made it work. Um, and so that, that, you know, that, that's, that's the best case scenario there, there is a playbook that he used, which we have, you know, now, now that he, now that he's done that to give him full credit, you know, we've, we've studied that playbook. And so we're attempting to replicate it, um, in other fields. Um, you know, the, the big thing we talk about there in our business is just like, is that, you know, look, the, that is a much, much harder entrepreneurial journey, right? Like that, that, that's just like the, the, what the entrepreneur has to sign up for to do that, like, and the risks that are involved are just like much harder. Um, than like, you know, for example, starting a new software company or something. Um, and so it's just a much higher bar of like competence that's required. Um, it's just much higher risk. You're going to lose more of those companies because they're just going to like not be able to make it. They're going to get blocked in some way. And then you you need a certain kind of founder who's willing to take that on. And that founder looks a lot like an Elon Musk. Or by the way, it looks like a Travis Kalanick, right? Or it looks like an Adam Newman, right? Or it looks like, a, you know, you know th th these are the, you know, or... Or by the way, in the past, it looks like Henry Ford, right? Um, you know, it, it, these it, it, this requires, you know, Attila the Hun, <laughs> Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, right? These are the, you know, to, to make that kind of company work requires somebody who is so smart and so um, determined and so aggressive and so fearless, right? And so resistant to injury <laughs> of many different kinds. Right. And so willing to take on just like absolutely cosmic levels of vitriol and hate and abuse. Right. And security threats and all the other crazy stuff um, like. And so, you know, speaking of growing people in like we need more of those people. I, I, I wish we could find a way to grow them in tanks. We don't know how to grow them in tanks. You know, we spend a lot of every day in our day job trying to find those people. You know, it's, we, we call it the, the, the problem of the missing Elons. Right. It's just like, you know, we need 10 more Elons and then we need 100 more Elons and then we need a thousand more Elons. And it's just like, I can just tell you, like, there there are not many Elons running, <laughs> running around. Um, and, you know, and Elon, like Elon, you know, people have like, as you, you well know, but like people have all kinds of reactions to Elon. Like, you know, uh, like these people put up with, you know, now look, Elon's been very successful. And he's made a lot of money and so forth. But like he puts up with a lot of shit from a lot of people on a lot of topics that would cause most people to melt into a little puddle. Um, and so this this is like the highest engagement I mentioned the top the Top Gun story, uh, the Top Gun movie. So Tom Cruise once said, he said there's Tom Cruise once said this great quote. He said there's there's only was he said there's only four professions uh, that are, are really that are really like fully masculine um, that are that, that like real men should actually pursue. And it's, he said it's a uh, fighter pilot, rock star, movie star, and president of the United States. Um, right. <laughs> and so you know, in theory, he's done three of those, two of those, three three of those if you count the movies. Depends on how we count. It becomes, it depends on how you count. Um, certain other people maybe have done more of those. Um, uh, you know, maybe the fifth is, you know, high octane entrepreneur, right? Operating in a regulated industry who just is determined to just like punch through the walls, you know, you know, category number five is Elon. And and so anyway, I just said like, this is the prize, like the, in our world, this is the prize. Like this is the prize. We, we wake up every day hoping the next Elon walks through the door. Generally, we get very smart entrepreneurs walking through the door. They're really good at what they do, but they're not the next Elon. Every once in a while, they ask us, what would it take to be the next Elon? And I describe what it would take. And they you get this like increasingly disturbed look on their face. And then they kind of decide they don't want to do that. Is this kind of the classic like, oh, if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it situation? Well, there's this question then, which is like, are these people like, was you know, so, yeah, was, was, I'll keep going to the Elon example. Like, you know, you know, nature versus nurture. Right. You know, was he, you know, was he was he born that way? Was he trained that way? Uh, right. Culture, um, you know, um, you know, you know, for sure, he's like, you know, super smart. Um, you know, there's a big nature component to that. He's super disagreeable, uh, right? He's maybe the most disagreeable person on the earth, on planet Earth right now. And that there's a big, uh, you know, kind of nature component to that. Um, 
but then look at you know he 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 you know he's he's articulated his life story like there are plenty of things that happened to him that caused him to develop an incredibly thick shell and to be incredibly determined and to not want to give up on things um and so you know a lot of that probably came from his you know cultural you know sort of cult- acculturated kind of experiences uh tra- traveling through life um and then you know look part of it's just like simple flat out determination like he just applies himself um it, you know with a level of effort and focus um you know and just every day um you know he works around the clock like it's really amazing uh, to watch um you know you know i mean we're used to workaholics and he's like at a whole different level um and so, um, you know, I don't know. Yeah, could you know, could you take more people who kind of have the right, you know, the right stuff, you know, in terms of being smart and disagreeable and intense, and could you train them up better? Probably. You know, we, you know, we try. That's, you know, that is kind of what we try to do. Yeah. Um, you know, that what said, you, like, you know, there, there's something special going on there. Why do you think it is that there is this kind of special category of like obsessive anger that's directed at particularly the entrepreneurial? billionaire. I mean, we're talking about, you know, U.S. senators tweeting billionaires should not exist, right? Like this is, it's sort of, it's very acceptable to say it's a widely shared view. Um, where does that come from? Why is it, why is that like a meme in our culture? Yeah. So I, I think it's all in Nietzsche, to be totally honest. I think it's, it's what he called resentiment, um, which basically is, it's, it's basically, it's, it's, a, it's, the, it's what he called the toxic blend of resentment, envy, and bitterness. Um, and so it's, it's, the, it's sort of, the, you know, it's the cornerstone of sort of modern culture, right? It's the cornerstone of Marxism. It's the cornerstone of, you know, progressivism. It's, you know, it's, it's the cornerstone kind of thing, which is like, we resent, you know, we, we resent people who are better than us. Um, you know, different it's societies have different kind of Christianity too, right? Yeah. Christianity, you know, the last will be first and the first will be last, you know, a rich man, you know, you know, will sooner pass through the eye of a needle than enter the kingdom of God. Right. Like, you know, you know, Christianity is, 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 you know, is sometimes described as sort of the final religion. You know, it's, it's, Christianity is described sometimes as the final, it's the last religion that can ever exist on planet Earth because it's the one that appeals to victims. Um, and the nature of life is there are always more victims than there are, you know, winners. Um, and so the victims are always the majority. And so therefore, one religion is going to capture all the victims or all the people who think of themselves as victims or want to identify as victims. Um, and, you know, that by definition is the majority. Um, you know, among lower class societies, sometimes, you know, lower class, you know, social science, they'll sometimes refer to a phenomenon called crabs in a bucket, um, where in a lower class environment, if one person starts to do better, the other people will drag them back down, right? You, you see, this is like a big problem in education in lower class environments. Um, and one kid starts to do good and the other kids start to bully him until he is going back, you know, until he's no better than the rest. Um, Scandinavian culture, you know, that I come out of, uh, it, you know, there's a term tall poppy syndrome, right? Um, you know, the, the tall poppy gets whacked. You know the the tall poppy growing in the field. You know gets 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 his head cut off. Um, you know the Japanese have their own version. Of, you know it, this again is it's almost like a cross. It's like a very deep human nature thing. It's basically just at the very deepest level. It's envy and resentment. Uh, and, and and the and you know the the nature of envy and resentment is like they're very satisfying feelings. Like you know resentment's like a drug, right? Like resentment is a very satisfying feeling because it's the feeling that lets us off the hook. Right. Like if I can resent somebody else, then I, then it's not my fault. It's their fault, not my fault. I, I, I'm not bad. They're bad. Right. And, and if they're more successful than I am, it just proves that they're worse than I am. Right. Because obviously they must be immoral. They must have committed crimes. They, you know, they must be making the world worse. Um, you know, they, they must be a destructive force. And so, yeah, no, it's look, it's, it's very, very deeply wired in, um, you know, uh, I guess I'll say this, you know, the, the entrepreneurs, the best entrepreneurs we deal with, they have no trace of it at all. Um, you know, the best entrepreneurs we deal with, you know, would just think the entire concept is just absolutely ridiculous. Like, why would I spend any minute thinking about whatever anybody else has done or whatever anybody else, you know, thinks of me? Like, th- that's crazy. Like, I'm just going to I'm going to make progress in my own life today. And the rest, the rest of what people think doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, the very nature of it. I mean, you know, look, you know, Nietzsche called it slave, mora- slave morality. Right. Which is, you know, the morality of the slave. And of course, the irony of slave morality is slave morality is, you know, in the modern world is, ta- is, is taken on primarily by people who are not actually slaves. Right. And so it, it's people who are choosing to have the morality of the slave, even though they actually are they even though they actually are free to also not do that. Um, and, you know, if, if you're if you're immersed in that world or you've been brought up in that world or you've been trained into that world um, or it's reinforced your natural inclination to be in that world. It's, it's really hard. You know, the, the, the message that comes across, it says, no, actually, no, actually the things that are going wrong in your life are not because other people are doing better. That's because like you're screwing everything up. Like, you know, who wants to hear that? Um, yeah. What are you reading, watching, listening to? And um, what do you think, what, what new-ish book is being slept on right now? What's a new-ish book that is good and underappreciated? 
Uh, let's see. Well, so I mentioned Burnham, so I, and, and I can't help myself. So um, uh, for anybody wanting to kind of really understand um, kind of this, the, like the thing we were talking about earlier about like the different models of capitalism, um, you know, so there's kind of two really key James Burnham books. Uh, one is called The Managerial Revolution, um, which, uh, uh, you know, kind of describes the, the sort of evolving shape of capitalism through the 20th century, which I think is probably the best explanation for what happened to get us where we are. And then there's another book called The Machiavellians, um, which is about kind of the structure of politics and society uh, in, in, in the sort of, you know, sort of democratic world. Um, so those are really good. Um, on on uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, so um, I've actually been reading my way all the way through both Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, which is very interesting. But um, there is a small book on the topic of resentment we were just talking about. Uh, there was a philosopher in the 1910s, 1920s named Max Scheler who wrote a book called Resentiment, um, R-E-S-S-I, uh, Resentiment, R-E-S-S-I, intimate. Um, and um, he, he basically, it's a short book. Uh, it's on Amazon. And he, he, he basically describes Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's theory of, of resentiment, uh, which we just talked about. And then he, he sort of elaborates on it. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that, that's really, you, you, read, you read that book and you're like, oh my God, like, yes, I'm surrounded by people just like that. Um, so there's that one. Um, what else? Um, uh, let's see. Give me a second here. Um, I just read, uh, I don't know if you, have you run into um, John Murray Cudahy? No. Have you run into this guy? So I just read his two books. Very obscure. Very Well, they're both online. You can get them both online on the Internet Archive. But um, they're, they're, sort of post, they're sort of post-Nietzschean. They're actually sort of on the same topics. Uh, it's, it's basically, they're on, they're on the topic of basically what happens when different societies basically clash. Um, when, 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 when societies encounter each other and then some societies are more developed than other societies, like some societies are more like materially prosperous than other societies. And basically like, what is the reaction that happens from that? And what are all of the different like coping mechanisms and, and changes that happen as a result? So his two books are both fantastic, uh, from the 1970s. So I'd recommend both of those, uh, more recent books. Um, I, okay. I'll give you two. I'll give you two that I think are sort of flip sides of this very interesting, some, some of the topics we talked about earlier. So two books on sort of the past and future of humanity that I recommend. So the sort of culture book is uh, Joseph Henrich um, uh, wrote the book on what he calls weird, um, yeah. which is, uh, is the book's called the weirdest people in the world. And, and weird is this acronym of Western educated, industrial, rich and democratic. Um, and Henrich is like the, the leading a anthropologist of his generation. And he, he, did, he came up with this very interesting breakthrough, which is he came up with a way to actually critique different cultures, but without being called racist um, and, or bigoted or xenophobic. And the way that he did it was he came up with this acronym weird to describe our culture. Um, so it, so it sort of is this like basically this little mechanism that he uses where like who, who can get mad at him for calling all, our culture weird. Um, like he say, he sounds like he's being self-critical, but, but what he's actually doing is it's actually a very interesting kind of uh, X-ray of the process of cultural development, both in the West and, and elsewhere. That's really interesting, um, and and you know there are still huge cultural uh, you know differences all around the world um, that uh, you know that are still very relevant that he he goes through in a lot of detail. Um, it's probably it's probably the best work of like cultural analysis written since like probably I don't know the 1950s or maybe 1930s or something because he figured out a way to actually kind of talk a little bit more openly about it. That um, one I've actually uh, I've read that and I really did not think when I opened it up that I was going to be learning that much about cousin marriage, uh, but it turns out that's a big one in there. Cousin marriage, cousin marriage, and, and is it okay, so we'll, we'll do a minor spoiler. So cousin marriage um, uh, turns out to be a really big deal because societies that have cousin marriage, basically cousin marriage is the mechanism for the perpetuation of a tribal society. Um, and so the way that tribes perpetuate and basically maintain sort of the coherence of the tribal identity um, and the tribal kind of feeling, the way that they do that is basically through cousin marriage. They, they basically have enough intermarriage among cousins where the, the tribe sort of, the, the, the barrier between the tribe and the rest of the world actually kind of remains intact. Um, and then the, the theory that he goes through is basically what, what, what happened in the West that caused the West to diverge, you know, with the Enlightenment and with modern economic development and scientific development and everything else that's happened in the last 500 years. The thing that caused the West to change and become what it is today is that the Catholic Church banned cousin marriage um, in Europe, um, which they did for their own self-interest. They did because it turns out they wanted the money <laughs> in his theory. Um, they wanted the bequests. Um, they wanted the money. They didn't want money. To, the Catholic church did not want money to stay in families. Uh, it wanted the families to basically fracture over time so that the money would go, would go back to the church. But the result of that was like in his argument, that was the, the change in human affairs that led to the Europe transitioning from being a tribal society to what it is today, um, which you could call an enlightened society. You could call an atomized society. Right. Um, you know, it led to the rise of the concept, essentially the modern concept of the individual. 
um, you know, which is still an alien concept in a lot of tribal societies. So, so that one's really interesting. And then, um, and then the, the sort of other, the flip side of that on the sort of, uh, uh, sort of genetic side, which is super interesting is this book called, uh, who we are and how we got here. Um, which is this, uh, it's a Harvard professor, David Reich, uh, who runs the leading lab that does, uh, this work in archeology span called ancient DNA. Um, where it turns out we now have the science to basically find like a skeleton that's thousands of years old, and the, the scientists actually know how to extract DNA um, and, to, you know, and, and actually analyze and actually analyze the DNA. And this you know this is like a huge breakthrough in archaeology for, for obvious reasons. Um, and so Reich is Reich is Reich and his lab at Harvard are actually um, uh, they are actually building out the actual the actual human family tree. Um, so the actual like genealogy of the human race, um, and, and it's why the book is called who we are and how we got here. Like it literally is like the actual genealogy of the human race, like where all these people came from, like how we all got descended from whatever we got, you know, all these questions, uh, and then how all the populations developed and how they intermixed or how they didn't intermix and so forth. Um, and, uh, it's just like, an, I just found that to be like an absolutely, it, it feels like an x-ray machine into the ancient world. Um, uh, through science, through modern cutting edge science that I found completely unexpected. Oh, and then I'll add, I'll add one final book, which is the best book on cults that I've ever read, uh, which is also relevant on the same thread, uh, which is The Ancient City, um, which is this book that was written in the 1860s uh, by this French scholar at the time. And um, it's sort of a, it's actually, it's, it's actually interesting. It's, he, he, he used a literary method. So this guy in the 1860s basically apparently read all original Greek and Roman literature, like apparently read all of it. Um, and then he derived from it basically what human civilization was like before the Greeks and Romans. Um, and so what it was actually like to basically be in a tribe uh, or be in a family, to be in a tribe or be in a city um, in like, you know, 2000, 3000 BC, 4000 BC, 5000 BC, and then sort of the changes that happened over time. And then, and then what, what actually happened when, when, when Greece and Rome arrived. Um, and, and, and if you read those three books together, you, you, it's like you, you get this kind of cultural analysis side, um, you get this archaeological analysis side, and then you get this like literary analysis side of like painting a picture of what the world used to be like, um, which is not <laughs> like the world is today. Um, and it's actually been very helpful for me to understand what the world is like today kind of as a, as a, as a derivation of, of, of how people used to live then. Um, uh, anyway, among other things that the ancient city talks about is it talks about the, the critical role of the cult. Um, and, um, the religion, basically the, the, the cult literally being a religious cult, literally being like the foundational model for, for human lives prior to what we now is, know as religions. Um, and so also if you find yourself in the business of wanting to create cults, it, 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 it turns out to be a good book. You know, there are days it's tempting. Um, so, you know, at that same point, 10 years ago, when you were making that prediction, I, a perhaps naive libertarian, um, had a lot of hopes that, um, that these technologies would be would finally be the thing that um, that took a bunch of our commerce and a bunch of our networks of trust outside of the realm of the state, or at least uh, another degree removed. Uh, and I think some of that was punctured quite quickly. You know, this idea that Bitcoin is anonymous, right, which was just never true. Um, but I I wonder what your what your sense is of whether ultimately there is still that kind of liberatory element to these technologies. Is there, is there good reason to think that we will live in a freer society when some of these things come to fruition? Or do we take the, uh, the cynical realists view that the regulators always have their way? Yeah, so I think I was I think economic freedom. I think you can I think you can make that argument still quite strongly. Um, political freedom, you know, maybe maybe not. Um, so the economic freedom argument is just like it's the same argument you make on the internet, which is like are people more economically free on the internet than they used to be in an old world of just having stores? And I think the answer is clearly yes. Like people people have the ability to offer goods and services much more broadly. They have the ability to buy from many more places. You know, uh, transparency of what people you know are buying is is much greater now than it used to be. Um, you know, reputation matters more than you know just you know whatever happens to be on the store shelves. Um, so, and, and then, you know, people can transact in, you know, categories of goods and services that maybe would have been hard to get at in the past. You know, so there, there's a whole bunch of like economic freedom arguments. Um, does that translate to political freedom? Um, you know, so the, the state, there's a couple of things, right? The state, you know, this is sort of obvious, but just to make the argument, right? So this, the state does have like one fundamental thing that's just hard to get away from, which is it, it just, it has territory. Like it has physical territory and then it has the ability to tax on that territory. 
Um, and so to the extent that you need to live anywhere, um, you're going to be living someplace and that place is going to want, you know, its share of your economic out, you know, your economic output. And they're going to show up, you know, the tax collector is going to show up when the tax collector shows up, he's going to want to, to get paid in his currency. Right. Well, and so oil again by having a body. It precisely, exactly. So the tax, if you're in the U S the tax collector is going to want us dollars. If you're in France, the, you know, the tax collector is going to want whatever currency they use these days. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I do believe like there, there's all these, oh, sorry, there's all these theories of what makes money money. Um, and, uh, one of the theories I like is John Law's theory, which is money is that which people trade with. Um, and the theory there basically is people will always find some sort of thing. Some, they'll always find something, whether it's cow shells or script currency or, or U.S. dollars or diamonds or art or Bitcoin that felt to trade with. Right? So m money as facilitation for trading. I do believe that. Um, but having said that, there's another theory of money as money is that which the sovereign taxes you for because um, you need to get whatever that is. You need to get some of that. Like even if you want to live in an all Bitcoin world in the U.S. today, you, at some point you need to convert to dollars because you need to pay your taxes and the, the IRS does not take Bitcoin. Um, so, so I kind of think those are both pretty, pretty solid, solid theories. As, and, and to me, those kind of argue for both sides of it, which is, yeah, you're going to have systems that are going to facilitate trade that are not necessarily, you know, the U.S. dollar or the euro or the yen. You're going to you're going to have, you know, you're, you're going to have online you know, alternatives to those. And, and you do today. And, and look, Bitcoin has been trading and being used for transactions continuously every minute of every day since 2009. Right. Um, and so, like, th those are going to exist. Um, but at the same time, like, yeah, we do have physical bodies, at least for now. We're going to be rooted someplace, at least for now. The tax collector is going to show up, at least for now. Um, you know, look, there's big outstanding regulatory issues right now in the whole space. Um, you know, there's the, and, and we're, here we're back to the original regulation discussion that we had, which is just like, there's tons of push and pull. There's lots of people who think that there ought to be more regulations, you know, in this space. There's tons of people who think that there shouldn't be. Um, there is the theory of enlightened regulation that will achieve the results that the regulators intend. And then there's the reality of the unintended consequences that always come with it. We're, we're back to that exact same, you know, dynamic in crypto regulation, you know, sitting here today, both in the in the U.S. and around the world, you know, I don't know, like, and then there's like, you know, the, the, another way to think about this is like, you know, this is constant, you know, the surface level kind of question is always just, well, aren't they just going to ban it, right? Like, so they just ban Bitcoin, and then it's like, well, how do you ban Bitcoin? Um, it's like it's ma it's it's an algorithm, like it's it's an algorithm, which means it's a mathematical formula. Um, the source code for it is available for free. Anybody can download and run that source code on their computer. Um, you know, for the government to ban, you know, for a government to ban Bitcoin, you know, they literally are putting themselves in, in a position where they're, they're banning math, you know, they're banning code, um, you know, like they can try, <laughs> um, you know, that the, the, the level of, of, I would say the level of tyranny required to ban math um, is, I think, way in excess, practically speaking, of what governments are either capable of doing or actually want to do. Like the North Koreans can probably do it. I, I don't know that. I don't know that our government would be allowed to do it, even by people who think that this stuff should be regulated. Um, so uh, yeah, I, you know, look, there, I think there's going to be some running room for for, for innovation here. Um, I also make a, a very different argument on this, which a lot of people respond to, which is, look, this is a technology of the future. Like at, at least like those of us who are those of us whose day job it is to like identify technologies of the future and help build them. Like this is one of those, like everybody, everybody in my world who's like really smart, they're all like, yes, this, this is a technology of the future. What exact shape it takes is, is open question, but yeah, this is a big deal. Uh, 30 years from now, this is going to be a really big deal. Um, and, and a lot of the smartest computer science people in the industry have gone into this field and are working hard on, on, on making it work and making it better. Um, and then it's like, okay, if there is going to be a technology of the future, would we, it's back to the question you asked about AI earlier. Um, would we like that technology of the future to be built and developed and housed in the United States? Um, or would we prefer to drive it offshore, you know, to other places? Um, and actually, uh, Rishi Sunak in the UK just came out with a very supportive uh, statement and policy, basic, essentially saying if U.S. regulators don't want this stuff in the U.S., that everybody should just come to the U.K. and do it there. You know, so, so maybe there will be an escape hatch to the U.K., you know, maybe to Singapore or someplace like that. Um, you know, or, or, you know, I don't know, or, or people will come to their senses and understand that they should, you know, this is something the country should actually invest in and support, or there will be attempts to regulate it and they just won't work well. And I, I, I don't know, uh, you know, th th those are all open questions right now. Um, this was great. Is there anything else that you think reason readers should know? <laughs> what, 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 a, what else what, to say? What message it, do you have for the people? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, here would be something. It's just like, yeah, I would say try the new stuff, right? Like, you tr try it, right? Like, you know, find a friend, you know, find a friend who has a Tesla and, you know, take it for a ride with the full self-driving turned on, 
right? Or like, you know, chat, you know, chat, you know, log in a chat GPT online and like log in and create an account and try it or, you know, you know, try, try a, uh, yeah, just like, you know, these things, you know, these, the, most of these things you can just like go online and either for, you know, trivial amounts of money or no money, you can just try and use. Um, I was just, you know, there's, there's just oceans and oceans and oceans of commentary on this stuff, you know, not, not, not you guys, but like from lots of other sources. And like, for most of it, it's just, you know, we, we out here just like shake our head being like, these people haven't even used this stuff. Like, you know, they're, they're debating shadows on the cave wall. You know, um, this is a longstanding uh, point that we make about guns. Yeah. There's a lot of people who have never shot a gun, who have a lot of opinions about guns. Every time you read about like, an, you know, automatic pistols, right? It's like, you know, it's like, okay, go shoot a pistol. <laughs> Hold the trigger down. <laughs> See what happens. Um, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I look. The tech industry, the, te the tech industry used to be top down. So the tech industry used to create products for like the government first and then big companies second and then small companies third and then regular people fourth. And in the last 20 years, that's reversed. The tech industry now, everything new that matters comes out for people first. It's, 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 it's the consumer markets lead. And then it's like years later, big companies and government start to figure out how to, how to deal with this stuff. And so anything new and interesting is something that you can literally just log on and try. Um, and um, it's all, it, it, yeah, the, the water's, the, yeah, the water's warm um, on this end of the pool. Like the, this stuff is actually, stuff is actually pretty cool. Thank you for talking to Reason. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for having me.